So our uh, next session, we'll talk about, uh, excuse me, could you either take your seat or your conversation outside? So our, our next session is, uh, is putting the modern Thai politics into historical context. It's an honor to welcome uh, Dr. Titanan Pong Sutarak to, uh, to Washington. I think uh, most of you know him. He's a very widely quoted. He is a professor at Chulalongkorn University, and he also heads up the Institute of Security and International Studies, one of Thailand's premier think tanks. So uh, Achan Tiranan is going to give a brief overview of the situation, and we'll have a brief time also for uh, question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, it, it's 15 minutes, not very long time. I, uh, I, I, I taught a course, the whole course on Thailand, Thailand's crisis, right, for, for 14 weeks, for almost four months. Uh, but for Washington, it's uh, maybe sufficient 15 minutes. I, I, I think we, we have uh, we've heard uh, the senior officials, uh, they've laid out uh, the Thai, Thailand's significance, importance in the Thai-U.S. Uh, relationship, uh, Thailand's uh, role in, in the region and so on. It reflects, you know, the kind of frustration uh, of our partners and friends. Thailand is very lucky. We have many, many friends in the world. I think the world just wants to see Thailand get over this hump and move on. Uh, and being in this hump, being stuck like this, means that uh, the region cannot fire on all cylinders. Uh, we, we have been kind of the laggard uh, constraining many of the endeavors in the region, in uh, you know, regional architecture, building, and so on. Uh, so this is a crisis that we have to get used to in Thailand. The Thais are, you know, it is very, it's depressing for me because uh, so much can be done. You know, Thailand is underperforming, uh, in some ways uh, non-performing. So I think we have to kind of brace ourselves for uh, some more time of this uh, crisis and polarization. It's been almost 10 years, and I think it could last another 10 years. Now, now that, that's not very uh, robust, uh, sanguine uh, outlook, but I think it's uh, something that's realistic. Now, on autopilot, the country does well. You know, this is a country that has suffered a lot in 10, you know, 10 years. How can you have an economy that still grows? Um, low rate now, but still uh, is not uh, in a contraction. And if you go to the malls and the restaurants in Bangkok, still very busy, bustling. Uh, the airport is uh, crowded. Uh, so the autopilot is, is very strong. The fundamentals in Thailand are strong. Uh, the shock absorbers are strong. Uh, this time, I think that the shock absorbers are being exhausted. Uh, and so I have just a few points to say. First, uh, you know, this is uh, the first time in a very long time that the usual uh, backstops and shock absorbers in Thailand are not working. So the, the big question that I've been asked many times is that, is this crisis any different than before? Thailand is full of crises. We've had a coup, a coup attempt every 4.3 years, right? Uh, it's a topsy-turvy place for diplomats, for business people, investors, uh, for academics. <laughs> uh, so many people have become accustomed to the topsy-turvy Thailand. It goes up and down, but eventually it regains a balance somehow. There's some kind of backstops that, that we are accustomed to, used to seeing. But now we're seeing a different kind of... Uh, crisis that the, the backstops don't work anymore. So the first thing I want to address is that uh, normally, you know, the backstops don't work anymore. Normally, we would have a new kind of recalibration settlement by now. We had a coup in September 2006, and new constitution in 2007, leading to an election in December 2007. But since then, uh, you know, we've had more elections, uh, no coup since then. But the place is still very unwieldy, unruly. Unlike the past, normally a military coup in Thailand is a reset. You know, you press the button, kind of a reset. And then things kind of gel and they work again until you have another build up to another kind of crisis. And then a reset uh, military coup. Now this time, uh, that's not working. The military coup, in fact, uh, it has led to the same kind of government, which has been kicked out, and the governments of uh, Thaksin Chinawat uh, and his uh, party machine. 
and they've been kicked out, but they keep coming back. They keep coming back. So this is a different time. This is a different crisis. Uh, you know the, the narrative, the timeline. Uh, Thaksin came in 2001. Actually, back then he was very popular to all sides. But then uh, after the re-election landslide in 2005, his ego and hubris got the better of him. He stopped uh, being deferential to, to key people in Thailand. And in Thailand, you know, we have a, a kind of a sophisticated, subtle hierarchy, and, and you know your place, uh, and you don't try to exceed or overreach. Uh, he did that, and, and that led to friction and conflict and eventually paved the way for the military coup in 2006. The difference with Thaksin is that he, you know, he was uh, ousted, uh, exiled, but he didn't go away, unlike the others before. Uh, so in a historical frame, uh, this is not, not the first time we're seeing this. Uh, I would like to, to, to cast this in two directions. This is a crisis of a, of a democracy, but also uh, uh, challenges that are, that are besetting and facing the monarchy. Somehow Thailand has to find a new balance, a recalibration between a electoral democracy that has its shortcomings, defects, has been abused, uh, manipulated by the Thaksin party machine and so on. But at the same time, uh, the monarchy, the monarchy-centered hierarchy uh, also has to make some adjustments. So if you see signs of this recalibration, adjustments, uh, making peace and uh, trying to regain a new balance, then those would be good signs. Uh, if you see what you're seeing in the streets of Bangkok, uh, in government house of Bangkok uh, as, as of the last two days, then those are not good signs. It means that uh, both sides are dug in uh, for, the, for a long fight. Uh, this is not the first time that we're seeing this kind of uh, unsettled Thailand. You know, the last, the, the different junctures, I'll, I'll just mention three. A uh, hundred years ago, this is a century-long crisis. Uh, you know, before the constitution in Thailand was introduced, 1912 to 1932, there was a series of rebellion, right? Very unsteady place. Rebellions were suppressed, but no concessions, no adjustments. So eventually, um, the system couldn't last. In 1932, uh, a group of young bureaucrats and military officers took, took power, seized power, and uh, abolished absolute monarchy, introduced the constitution. And then the place was very topsy-turvy in the 30s through the World War II until 1958, when they outright, uh, very entrenched and uh, firm, harsh military dictatorship took hold. And that cleared the slate for 25 years, a military dictatorship. During that time, Thailand, you know, the, the dictatorship years did two great things for Thailand, kept communism away, enabled economic development, working with technocrats and so on. And that military dictatorship period was built around the, the monarchy, the bureaucracy, the military, through the Cold War. Very important. I think the independent variables here, the international environment has changed. Uh, and we've heard you know, military coup is no longer accepted or acceptable. Uh, economic development meant that people have more education, more information, and so on. So they, they are more awakened, more politically conscious uh, they want more, they have more expectations, more demands. Uh, and then after the dictatorship, you had student uprisings and, uh, you know, the most comparable period now and in the past is the mid-1970s. In the mid-1970s, very unstable, volatile, violent, uh, assassinations, protests, all kinds of protests uh, on a daily basis, uh, and, uh, you know, bombings, shootings, had elections that uh, led to nowhere. At that time, there was communism uh, to unite the, the various forces in Thailand on, on the right. And then, you know, they, they retook power. Had a military coup in October to 1976, October 1976. Very harsh coup, uh, including, you know, shootings of students and so on. That cleared the slate. It settled the place. It settled the place. And then up and down, up and down, until the 1980s, we had General Prem as a prime minister, kind of a compromise, halfway compromise. Uh, prime minister from the army, but the 
political parties, politicians can have elections and can have some cabinet portfolios, they can have their graft, their corruption, their projects and commissions, but finance, def defense, uh, finance, defense, interior, foreign affairs were controlled by the general prem, prime minister, and he appointed the technocrats. So that was a good kind of halfway compromise at that time in a semi-democratic arrangement. The second most comparable juncture is the late 1980s when we had the government of Cha Chai Chun Wan. We had the election in July 1988, and General Prem said, no more, I've had enough of the politicians and the squabbling and the corruption and so on. So he said, goodbye. General Cha Chai took power, and you know, many of the ideas that we're seeing that under Thaksin, uh, there's some continuity with the Cha Chai period. Uh, you can see that uh, they want to make Thailand as the vortex of mainland Southeast Asia, right? Around Indochina and now at Myanmar's opening. And then to use the mainland Southeast Asia to leverage for the Asian landmass and beyond. Uh, this is a kind of a vision they had. And they had the same advisors. Cha Chai's advisors uh, eventually were holdovers that worked for Thaksin in the 2000s, early 2000s. Uh, that period uh, is comparable because it was uh, beset by corruption and graft. Uh, you know, actually the corruption, they had a nickname for it, it was buffet cabinet, you can pick and choose. Uh, your corruption, your commissions, uh, which projects you want to, to, to tap into. Uh, and it of course led to a loss of legitimacy and a military coup in February 1991. Similar to the way Thaksin was kicked out, corruption was a key issue. You know, there was also uh, complaints about usurpation, uh, disrespect for the crown, um, usurpation, manipulation of the bureau bureaucracy, transferring senior officials and so on, and a parliamentary dictatorship also was another accusation that at that time. The reset worked again. You know, our reset is a military coup, constitution, election, corrupt government, military coup. <laughs> and it, it worked in 1991, 1992, had an Anand government. A technocratic government did a lot of things, uh, including the taxis that you see in Bangkok, media taxi, VAT, tax, and so on. Uh, and then we had a new constitution, a real reform, leading to a new constitution. Uh, the 1997 constitution led to an uh, eventual election in 2001. And this is where we've been stuck. So the last 14 years, uh, Thailand has had this dilemma. You know, you have uh, a winning party that gets kicked, kicked out 2001, Thaksin won almost by its overall majority. 2005, huge uh, re-election landslide. Became the first prime minister to complete a full term, first to have a one-party government. Uh, and it was quite a phenomenon at that time. And very popular on the policy side. Had this uh, debt suspension, microcredit scheme, cheap health care. Uh, captivated uh, the imagination, captured hearts and minds. Uh, 2005, you know, his ego got the better of him and became kind of, uh, uh, he overreached and, uh, you know, after the coup, but this coup this time, 2006, didn't, didn't solve the problem. First, because Thaksin kept winning. So we have the problem of, you know, the, the, the winner gets kicked out, but the, the electoral losers, uh, you know, they're put in, but they can't win the election. So here again, time and again, we're seeing Winners are not allowed to rule. Uh, those who ruled can win elections. And uh, I always say that, you know, if the Democrats can win the election, this will be the end of the crisis. But that's, uh, you know, I can go a long time, uh, not enough time for the Democrats, because uh, they, they have a lot to answer for. So this is the, the two main junctures. You know, the, you know, the place is a topsy turvy, and it gets to a point, uh, then some settlement, and then clear slate, and it gets topsy-turvy again, some settlement, clear slate, topsy-turvy, reset. Uh, most comparable, uh, October 1976, there was kind of a backlash, reactionary backlash, and now we're seeing a kind of a, a, a sophisticated, uh, nuanced backlash as well, the conservative uh, movement that we're seeing with the protesters in Bangkok and so on, they, they want to go back to the past more than going to the future. They see the future, electoral democracy has been abused. It's, you know, manipulated by Thaksin, his party machine, it's full of corruption. It lacks moral authority, doesn't have any integrity. 
So they want to have an appointed government. That's what they are calling for in, in Bangkok now. The other side, electoral democracy is the only way. Cannot be denied. We need elections. We were, you cannot run Thailand without elections. So they are opposed to appointed government. Uh, that electoral democracy, of course, uh, has its shortcomings, and it is uh, manipula manipulated by, by the Thaksin side. So that's the dilemma between the two, the two sides. Somehow, uh, if they can come to terms uh, and the electoral democracy, I think in my, in my outlook, you, know, you, you need democracy that doesn't just end with elections. You need uh, deepening institutionalization. Our legislature is very weak. You need more accountability and so on. Uh, but uh, the answer is not to deny a popular mandate and uh, not allow elections and not allow the winners to, to rule. Uh, so that's on the democracy side, drawing from the past. Uh, it's 100 years since the constitution was introduced and still, we're still working on constitutionalism in Thailand. Now on the monarchy side, there are some challenges. You know, the protesters today, they want to have uh, a royally appointed unelected government. Uh, they want to draw on the moral authority of His Majesty the King. The monarchy, His Majesty the King, has been on the throne for 68 years, long time. Thailand has never known anything different. I think almost just about every Thai person who's alive has grown up under this reign. It's been a glorious reign. But like U.S.-Thai relations, like many other systems and uh, things, uh, times change. Uh, and unless you change with the times and make adaptations and some concessions, uh, there will be a lot of friction. So the comparable period that I can, you know, the different junctures, but I would point out uh, uh, the, the reigns of uh, King Rama II, King Rama III, and IV. And that's a long time, uh, long time ago. But the reference point, in fact, is your, your President Jackson. You know, in 1833, Thailand had a king, King Rama III. But before King Rama III came to the throne, King Rama II, days before he passed away, and I think that he, you know, he's, he had a sense that uh, his, his days were numbered. He told his uh, eldest son, King Mongkut from the King and I, to go be a monk. And the reason being that uh, a, a, a white elephant had died. It was a bad omen for the nation. And being a monk would make uh, merit and it would be uh, good for the nation. So King Mongkut went to be a monk for 27 years. His brother, from a concubine, not from the chief queen. King Mongkut was from the chief queen, so Prince Mongkut went to be a monk. Uh, King Rama III was 20 year, 21 years older. Right, this is 1824. Uh, so he ascended, ascended to the throne, and uh, he was seen as a technocrat, accepted by the court. The accession council chose him. Uh, he had all the, the right makings, he had experience. He oversaw the economy, so he had uh, legitimacy. So he was king for 27 years, until he passed away. And then Prince Mongkut, who had been ordained as a monk, you know, he got out of the monkhood and became king for 17 years. Uh, and we know about that because of the king and I um, uh, you know, the story, and then the, it led to King Rama V. Uh, but we had two kings at that time. During the, the King Mongkut's era, uh, his brother uh, was also seen as a technocrat, uh, prepared for the throne, but you know, he's not in line. So King Mongkut appointed you know, Prince Bin Glau, uh, so he became king as well, has equal status. And you know uh, that he was very prominent because in the official, his official name in Thai is about th three lines. You know, we have this Pali-based uh, language. When you have a very long name like that, you're the king, or you're the, <laughs> the monk, you know. So he had equal status, but uh, the first among, first among, between the two equals was King Mongkut. Uh, now, this period, we are seeing a lot of tensions in Thailand, and I think that we uh, still have some obstacles, some kind of... Kind of uh, uh, catharsis transformation that we're going through and uh, the overarching uh, frame and dynamics I think have to do with uh, the, the royal succession and uh, you know behind the scenes and uh, many people will know this without saying it 
um, the question becomes, you know, who's going who's gonna to be the next king? Right? And uh, I would like to say that it, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. It, if it becomes a zero-sum game, then we have problems. Uh, so that's the first thing that we need to do in Thailand, not to see this as a zero-sum game uh, of the, the next uh, monarch. And then after that, we will have to uh, uh, recalibrate uh, monarchy and democracy and the constitutional rule so that democracy is not easily abused, manipulated by the likes of Thaksin. At the same time, the monarchy has to be uh, framed, reframed within the constitution. And if we can do that, if you see signs of that, that means that Thailand is going in, in the right direction. I hope it will not take too long because the longer it takes, the cost and pain and grief that we are, we are seeing and feeling. Uh, and we need all the friends in the world. We could have this seminar in European capitals, in the Asian capitals, and I think we have such international goodwill. You know, even the Cambodians want the Thais to get on. Um, <laughs> you know, Myanmar says, you know, they're worried, they want to see the solutions. Uh, so the international goodwill is there. We are lucky that uh, there are no regional meddlers, you know, unlike Ukraine, Syria, and so on, and no regional powers trying to meddle and influence what's happening inside. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, everybody is so flustered, you know, they say the Thais just go solve the problem and, and uh, we'll stay here, but they want to do something. So there's a risk here of trying to do too much. I think the, the, the best thing that the international community can do is, is setting parameters, and they've done that. We've heard from uh, the two senior officials that, you know, military coup is not good, uh, right? Constitutional rule, uh, democratic process, and things like that, no violence. So those are uh, clear parameters, and they make a big difference. That's why we haven't had a coup in Thailand. They make a big difference. So in Thailand, going forward, we'll see in the near term, one of three things will happen. Either there will be a military coup. It looks unlikely. Uh, I think the military would not take, they will not do the heavy lifting the way that they used to. Uh, if you, have a, you get rid of the government, okay, you change the government. They will enforce it for you, but they won't go and change the government for you. So if not that, then we'll have a royally appointed government based on Article 7 that the protesters are calling for. If not that, then we'll have election in July, planned for July 20th. Uh, and I do hope that, uh, you know, July 20th is, doesn't look like that long, but in Thailand, every day is a long time now, uh, especially in Bangkok. So if we can get there somehow with all players uh, in and try to kind of have a stopgap ad hoc uh, interim elected government some reforms in place so that all can, can, can rejoin and re-enter, uh, then uh, we might just navigate a way out of this murky um, you know, environment and uh, uh, the brink uh, of the abyss. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tittenden. That was, that was a great... Um, uh, overview of how how Thailand got where it is today, and some some ideas of how it might move to the to the future. The floor is open for some questions. In the back, please. Please identify yourself. Wait for a mic. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Heru. I'm from SAIS. Uh, thank you, Achantiyanan, for a very uh, comprehensive approach and introductory uh, remarks on. The uh, political uh, history of Thailand. Uh, the funny thing about this crisis, the, uh, the, cred, the course that you just mentioned that we didn't get to do the, the exams afterwards. Instead, we got to ask you questions. And my questions uh, related to your presentations, the fact that in the three comparable, two comparable crises in, in the history of Thailand that you mentioned, the one in the 70s and the one in the, uh, in the 1990s, uh, I think, in my opinion, the key uh, distinction between the previous two and the, the last one is the, the decisiveness of the royal intervention. Uh, in 2006, uh, the king did not have a very a resolute uh, so-called statement uh, that uh, uh, given to, to, to resolve the crisis vis-à-vis -vis the, 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 the way that, that uh, the military coup functioned, as, as you mentioned, or, or you said by it. What the king did at the time, if I recall correctly, was to give more uh, emphasis on the, on the constitutional ruling when, when he appointed the constitutional court. And uh, my question is related to how do you see the neutrality of the constitutional court in, in Thailand throughout this crisis in 2006 and in, in the past eight years in try to uphold the message that uh, given by the, the king at the time? Uh, and how then, uh, is, is, is there any possibility that Thailand 
uh, could go back to the 1997 constitution, which dubbed as the most democratically uh, constitution in the country uh, throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you, Heru. Uh, Sai, student intern with me at, uh, at ISIS in Bangkok. Good question. Uh, 2014, similar to 2006. It's a murky year. You know, no settlement, very unwieldy, unruly. Things happen very volatile day to day, week to week. Uh, in April 2006, His Majesty the King uh, gave some remarks uh, to the judges, saying that, you know, at that time we had a uh, intractable crisis, right? Election, the election commissioners were answerable to Thaksin. Uh, the election was boycott, boycotted by the Democrat Party, the first boycott. And then the, the results were illegitimate, and there was some cheating and fraud and so on. So no way out. They scheduled another election for October. But His Majesty said, you know, one party election cannot be democratic. And it was a, the duty of the, the judges to, uh, to navigate a way out of this crisis. Since then, we have seen very politically assertive uh, judiciary. And the judiciary in Thailand has uh, set political directions, and they continue to do so. Uh, and the way you do it is you just, you know, you, you rule against uh, the ruling parties, the, the sitting government. You can disqualify the sitting prime minister for a cooking show that he accepted some small honorarium, or uh, disqualify Yingluck for nepotism. Uh, so we're seeing more and more of this. And a long-term risk for us here is that uh, the judiciary now uh, has lost some credibility, has been compromised. And I think many people will, will uh, concede to that, even to, um, supporters of the, um, you know, of the judiciary. Uh, but they see as the end justifying the means. Uh, the only way to get rid of the toxin party machine, then you, know, you have to uh, do what's necessary. Uh, it's come at a very high cost in the long term. Uh, we need to restore that credibility. Otherwise, the, the, you know, my worst fear is that Thailand has no backstop left. Once you have no institutional pillars to rely on, you need to rely on something. Uh, otherwise, every man for himself. Uh, so that's a long-term long -term danger for us. Uh, you know, the anti-toxin backlash was so strong, but I think the pendulum has swung too far. Uh, and you know, So let's hope that we can do that. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, Elizabeth Becker, Simon & Schuster. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, and um, certainly I, I feel I have a better understanding of what's going on in Bangkok. The one piece I'd also like you to comment on is the, the rural voice that was so strong pro-toxin and how your various scenarios will play with the rural vote. Thank you. Thank you. I encourage you to listen to the following panel and, and other experts uh, who will speak also on the, uh, the rural uh, electorate. The understanding that we have uh, that is portrayed is that the North and Northeast, you know, they comprise more than half of the electorate. And they have been voting for toxins parties all these years. And uh, to a large extent, it's true. I mean, the numbers show it when they, when they vote. Uh, but it's not the stereotypical kind of farmers you know, versus the, the urbanites and, and so on. There's no more, I think that there are very few uh, stereotypical, prototype, prototypical farmer, the village farmer, uh, left in the villages. I mean, they have motorcycles, they have refrigerators, they actually are very modernized and mechanized. Uh, so they have been supportive of Thaksin, yes, North and Northeast, but he's lost some support too. And February 2nd election, you know, the, the Thaksin populist magic has worn off considerably. The first generation populism, that suspension, microcredit, uh, village fund, cheap healthcare, that just captured hearts and minds, right? But after a while, he came up with rice patching, the second generation, and it's a disaster. Uh, some farmers haven't received the money they, they've been uh, told they would, and uh, fiscal losses are just accumulating. So, uh, you know, the first car policy, you know, this is the idea, you just first car, first home, handouts and subsidies, giveaways, and uh, this time, after a decade, it doesn't feel uh, so innovative, imaginative. It's just to, to win the vote. And I think that a lot of people are feeling that way uh, in the countryside, in the rural electorate. 
So if you were to hold election today, uh, last one we had on February 2nd, the, vote, the turnouts were lower. The Democrats boycotted, so we will never really know the, 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 the results and how it could have gone, but the Democrats could have gained some ground. And the third parties, third, fourth, and fifth parties could have gained some ground to dilute uh, the, the juggernaut uh, party machine that Thaksin has. And I think now is a, is a, it, the time is better than ever to try to win at the polls. And that is really the best way, the only way, sustainable way uh, to, to beat Thaksin is to beat him at his game at the polls. Uh, unfortunately, the tyranny of the clock keeps ticking. Um, so we're going to take a, a short break now, and um, and then we'll return uh, with an, with another session that's going to talk about, it, as uh, Dr. Titnan already said, how the crisis will shape the future political order. Uh, Dr. Titnan, thank you very much. That was great.